Like a deadly game of cat and also cat, we're looking at maze craze this episode. Last video, we looked at Dodgem, a VCS conversion of the arcade game head-on that also happens to be something of a stepping stone towards 1980s monster hit arcade game, Pac-Man. Dodgem also hit shelves about the same time as another VCS game that essentially hits on the other side of Pac-Man style, Maze Craze. Both Dodgem and 1978's Slot Racers are also early examples of games that take place in mazes, but Rick Maurer's game is entirely about the maze itself. A quick note about Maze Craze in today's video. Much like games that use a lot of computational cycles like video chess or video checkers, the VCS will throw up a screen of random flashing colors while it designs its random mazes and ensures they're capable of being finished. These color flashes will lose sync with video capture equipment, and so, typically speaking, the first few moments of each maze are cut off. I didn't feel like it was worth contending with an emulator, so we're just gonna roll with it. Maze games do have a little bit of a computer gaming pedigree, after a fashion. Among the earliest game programs was Mouse in the Maze, a demo for the TXO computer that was first publicized in January 1959. This program allowed users to design a maze with a light pen and set loose a computer-driven mouse to try and find cheese laid down throughout. If the mouse didn't get cheese within a certain time period, it would lose energy and the game would end. Another version of the game swapped the cheese out with martinis and had the mouse stagger its way through the maze as it got progressively drunker. Mouse in the Maze was, in turn, directly inspired by Claude Shannon's 1952 Theseus Maze, a problem-solving electromechanical mouse that used relays to navigate a maze that the user designs, looking for the robot equivalent of cheese. But neither of these can really be considered a game in the modern sense. Rather, they are AI experiments. Actual games built around mazes would not exist until the 1970s. The arcade space appears to have been a leading edge in this regard. In October 1973, Atari published Gotcha, a rudimentary maze game where one player scores points by touching the second player, while the second player earns points over time by simply not being caught. In the Atari Business is Fun book, Atari engineer Al Alcorn indicated that he got the idea from defective Pong arcade boards. He said that a bad gate in the circuit that put up the scores on screen would cause the segments that make up those numbers to appear all over the display. Alcorn connected that defective portion to a motion circuit, causing segments to move around the screen, in essence creating an ever-changing dynamic maze. Steve Mayer of Cyan Engineering built this idea out into a functioning game. Gotcha is perhaps better known today for having a salacious design in the earliest cabinets produced where the controls were shaped like breasts. But it is also notable for its color graphics variant that came out at the same time. While most gotcha machines were either straight black and white or used colored overlays on the screen to mimic a color display, a small number were produced with a daughter board capable of adding color. This makes Color Gotcha the first arcade game to feature color graphics, even if the production run was incredibly small, estimated between 20 and 100 units. The true leap in maze game technology came with the advent of the microprocessor. Dave Nutting Associates was a pioneer in the usage of microprocessors in arcade games, with their title Gunfight being among the first game to use one instead of discrete circuits when it was published by Bally Midway in 1975. According to interviews with Nutting and his developers Tom McHugh and Jamie Fenton, Jeff Fredrickson initially tested out their Intel 8080 design by having it randomly generate mazes. This test would be turned into a full game around November 1976 called The Amazing Maze, with McHugh having worked on it as well and Fenton noting that she probably contributed a bit given the collaborative environment of Dave Nutting Associates. Amazing Maze is a time-based game where two players work to navigate these randomly generated mazes and try to be the first one to escape through the opponent's entryway. Escaping a maze netted a player a point, and whoever had the most points at the end of the time won. This was a huge step forward for the maze game genre, and was a clear influence on what would develop on home platforms in the coming years. But before we get to those, however, I would like to note that Dungeons & Dragons was first published in 1974 and would grow in popularity through the rest of the decade. These early incarnations of the tabletop role-playing game were, functionally, maze games. The game was designed around the idea that players would venture into labyrinths, fight monsters, and earn treasures and acclaim in the process. While it's unclear if this game was any influence on the console maze games we'll be seeing in a moment, Dungeons & Dragons undoubtedly was a force in computer maze games like 1978's Dragon Maze which in turn inspired early role-playing video games like Akalabeth. 
But back in the console realm, the late 1970s into the early 80s saw a slew of maze games where players competed to get through a maze with varying degrees of obstacles in the way. The earliest of these was Maze, developed by Michael Glass and published by Fairchild for the Channel F in November 1977. Glass unfortunately passed away in 2003, and at the 2004 Classic Gaming Expo, his former co-worker Rick Maurer, who did the Atari VCS Space Invaders conversion and today's game, said that he didn't know where Glass drew his inspiration from for it. And it doesn't take much of a leap to see how Maze owes a great deal of itself to Amazing Maze. Maze features randomly generated maps that players must maneuver through, though in this case both players start at the same entrance. Glass included a few variations to keep things interesting. There's a jailbreak mode where the walls contain hidden passages and a blind man's bluff mode, where the path through is invisible and players can shroud their tracks as they maneuver through. Adding to these modes are options to play cat and mouse, where a computer-controlled cat comes into the maze from the exit and tries to eat the two players, a paranoia version where the game cannot end until one player has been eaten by the cat, and a final mode where there is no cat or exit, just a maze to wander around until you get bored. All in all, it's a pretty feature-complete package, and for someone who liked Amazing Maze in the arcades, this was a pretty good approximation. About a year after Fairchild's game was released, Bally released a home conversion of Amazing Maze on the professional arcade. Developed by Bill Jonke, this home Amazing Maze is essentially identical in gameplay to the arcade original, with randomly generated mazes and players starting at opposite ends. It lacks all the variations of the Channel F game, but it does have a bit more audio-visual flair, and lets you set the victory score to whatever point total you want. Fenton said that home conversions of Bally Midway games generally entailed passing along the source code to the arcade original to the home developer, which likely explains why Amazing Maze for the professional arcade hews so closely to its bigger cousin. The Bally Arcade also features a basic game called Memory Maze, wherein the screen will flash a maze for 10 seconds before turning it invisible. The player starts with 9 points per maze, but will lose 1 point for running into a wall and 3 for bringing up the maze again to help navigate providing a bit of risk-reward arrangement if you don't have a great memory or don't want to cheat with a smartphone. This particular game was written by Steve Walters. It appears to have been sold on cassette through the Arcadian newsletter starting in December 1980, only a short time after today's game reached stores. And this brings us to Atari's Maze Craze. The game itself is directly inspired by Glass's Channel F Maze, according to comments by Moore. Moore worked on Maze Craze while taking a break from Space Invaders. According to his interviews in the Stella at 20 documentary, he'd been working on Space Invaders for about four or five months before deciding to shelve it, both due to a lack of interest from Atari staff and from not being able to figure out how to get rid of intense flickering on the invaders. Moore started working on his own version of Maze, in turn setting that aside to finish Space Invaders once Atari management was interested in releasing it. After that, he came back around to his Maze game to finish it off. The manual does shift the premise from Glass's game. Instead of cats and mice, the objects on screen are now cops and robbers. The text assumes you're a police officer, and for the purposes of this video, we'll stick with the booklet's explanations, but honestly, it doesn't make a difference. You let your little stick person represent what you want. Mora noted that he loved adding variations to games going back to his Fairchild days, and this is on full display with Maze Craze. Besides the standard go through the maze mode, there are eight major variations and different combinations that result in 16 major game modes. There are capture settings where the player characters, considered cops in the manual, must catch three robbers before they can win the game. There's robber settings where two, three, or five computer controlled opponents try to catch the human players to knock them out of the game, and they must be avoided. There are wound games where if touched by the robber, the player's character will stop and slowly continue along their path for a few seconds. A terror mode where you cannot win until your opponent has been knocked out by a robber. A blockade mode where you can put up fake walls to trick your opponent. And invisible maze games. These invisible mazes are in turn broken down by three more variants. One where the maze flashes on screen periodically. One where players can peek at the full maze by pushing the button and one where players have scouts that randomly move through the maze and show the paths around them. Finally, each and every one of these 16 game types allows you to select game speed and the degree of visibility between 4 degrees each, leaving you with a whopping total of 256 individual variations on this game to appreciate. The difficulty switches will also adjust player speed to either be as fast as the robbers or faster than they are, adding an additional wrinkle. You may recognize some of these game type descriptions from the Channel F game, 
but there is certainly a lot more to work with here if you're into the genre. The robber modes in the terror game type are all lifted straight from the Channel F game, as is the idea of leaving fake walls behind you in blockade games. Maze Craze has game types that work for one player, though it defaults to having a second player always on screen. Played by oneself, Maze Craze is a decent enough experience. The computer-controlled robbers can be tricky to evade in the 2, 3, or 5 robber modes, and the terror game types. And they're hard to catch in the capture games. The maze options with limited visibility can be tricky to maneuver through. And auto-peak game types, you only have a few moments to see the maze every so often, during which the computer is continuing to move through the level. And player peak modes can be similarly exasperating given that they have a recharge time between uses. The scout game type is an interesting take, however. The scouts can be activated by pushing the button on the controller and only travel a short distance, but will effectively show you every passageway near your present location. The visibility options can be sorely missed in the game types, with no variations at all if you have low visibility turned on. With two players, Maze Craze gets a bit more interesting. Players, for the most part, are unable to impact each other as besides leaving fake walls behind in blockade mode, but there is a heightened sense of urgency in trying to clear a maze before your opponent, or attempt to avoid an enemy robber before they stop you in your tracks. The low visibility modes are again a bit frustrating, but do help level the playing field if one player is much better than the other at solving mazes. This all said, maneuvering through the maze can prove tricky on the speedier game type, as Maze Craze is particularly unforgiving about overshooting an intersection. While this is a little bothersome in single-player games, it can make or break an attempt to finish two-player games before your partner. There is one more maze game to touch on here, exclusive to the video pack G7000, the European Odyssey 2, and published in 1981, called Labyrinth. While there is a normal work-your-way-through-the-maze game type, this version also brings back the moving maze shape from Gotcha. In those game types, the walls will constantly shift around, meaning you can be stuck waiting for a passage to open up to reach the goal. Also, you can set the goal to move too, in case you wanted to be a little more annoyed. It's a pretty decent take on a maze game, but after seeing what competing platforms had put together, it does seem like a thin experience, and a little obvious why it never came out in North America. Maze Craze did receive accolades in Creative Computing's September 1981 roundup of VCS software, wherein author David Ahl remarked it received high marks from the review team. While he found the low visibility mazes more frustrating than fun, particularly the game type with scouts, he wrote that everyone on the team seemed to have at least one favorite variation. While as of this recording no information is out there about how the game did on the market in the early 80s, Atari Corp did ship 3,016 copies between 1986 and 1988. Not great numbers, but arguably about as well as you'd expect from a game whose genre had really left it behind. Yes, Maze Craze came out at a time when the maze game genre was really evolving in a few new ways that rendered it more of a curiosity by 1986. The novelty of mazes being randomly generated by a computer was no longer really enough to sell a game like it did a decade earlier in 1976. Instead, you started seeing maze games where the levels were predetermined and the player had to achieve specific goals within the labyrinth. For example, some games like Wizard of War required players to move through the game's space eliminating monsters. Others, like Rally X, Head-On, or Pac-Man, required players to dodge foes while collecting specific items to reach the next stage. And on computers, the maze genre was moving into first-person territory with D&D-inspired games like Wizardry, and eventually this would lead to first-person shooters like Facebook 2000 and Doom, and first-person games on the VCS like Escape from the Mind Master. While Maze Craze does what it sets out to do admirably well, the game really released at a time when what it was doing was rapidly being overtaken by innovations elsewhere. Still, that's enough for Maze Craze to have a following who do appreciate the game. It's arguably the best game of its type produced at the time, and remains eminently playable today. This also seemingly represents the last VCS game for 1980 published by Atari. Maze Craze, Dodgem, and Video Checkers were all announced alongside a fourth game, Championship Soccer but it is unclear from newspaper advertising if the latter actually reached store shelves at the same time, or if it was delayed by a few months into 1981. Based on what I've turned up, I'm planning it to kick off 1981 in this chronology. Either way, Activision isn't done with 1980 quite yet, with two more releases before we conclude this major year for the VCS. And as for Rick Moore, he moved over to the coin-op division of Atari to work on the Asteroid sequel Space Duel before leaving the game industry entirely. After a few appearances at the Classic Gaming Expo in the mid-2000s, 
Moore has effectively vanished, and it's unclear if he's simply done talking about his video game work or if he's passed away. His VCS legacy is very much secured though, with two very good games, one a platform defining work and the other the pinnacle of its genre, under his belt. <laughs> Next time, Activision returns and challenges you to the slopes.